the main, the main event, uh, which is a, going to be a very interesting talk. Uh, I know that. And who, who was going to ask the question about why is it snowing? That's <laughs> well, I'm really delighted to uh, be introducing Kathy Whitlock, who is just renowned. She's just a renowned scientist. She is a Regents Professor in Earth Science at MSU. She is a fellow of the Geologic Society of America. She is a fellow of the American Association, American AAAS. American, American Association for the Advancement of Science. That one. That one. And, and she's been elected to the, the National Academy of Science as well. These are all very high honors. Um, she's the first scientist from a Montana institution who has been elected to the National Academy of Science. Hopefully not the last. <laughs> Hopefully not the last. Um, she's been at MSU since 2004, and she, before that, was at University of Oregon. Mm -hmm. uh, she's had a long and very, well, obviously, renowned career. And I'm not going to talk anymore. I'm just going to let her, let her go. She's got lots to say. Sounds great. Thanks. Thanks. Well. Happy Valentine's Day, everyone. <laughs> I hope you all have big plans for this evening. Um, thanks to John for inviting me. I appreciate it, and I'm really happy to be here. Um, I wanted to tell you about the Montana Climate Assessment. It came out in 2017. How many of you have looked at it at all? It's online, and uh, so we've had a year to go around the state and talk about climate change, so I thought I'd do kind of a I do two things. We talk about the assessment and what's in it, but also tell you a little bit about some of the things that the reactions that I've been getting going around talking to Montanans. So first let me, before I digress into the climate assessment, let me just tell you a little bit about myself and how I got involved in this project. I'm a paleoclimatologist or a paleoclimate person, and when you study Paleoclimate, you're looking at climate change not just over years or decades, but you're going back centuries and millennia. And to do that, you have to rely on, on proxy data to get information about past climate. So in this paleoclimate world, we look at things like speleothems in caves or soils. My group looks at pollen and charcoal, but my colleagues look at diatoms. There's just a whole diverse area of pa in paleo climate studies, and we're part of this bigger climate science sort of research group. Uh, in Montana, if you want to know anything about long-term climate change, you really have two data sets to go to. One is tree ring records. Uh, our oldest trees, some of them are almost a thousand years or so, but most of them, are, our trees are a couple of centuries, and you're looking at variations in the ring width. I think probably most of you know about that kind of science. And then uh, if you want even longer records, you go to lake sediments, and that's my primary area. Um, lakes are great repositories of environmental information, so pollen and charcoal and chemical signals and so on land on the surface of a lake, and then they get incorporated in the sediment, and so we go to those lakes and get the sediment cores. The top layer is the present day, and you can go back to whatever the age of the lake is, and uh, most of the natural lakes in Montana are about 15,000 years. So you can get an environmental and a climate history going back, going from present back 15,000 years in these sediment cores. So my group goes out and we get these cores and we slice them open and then we slice them into fine increments and we subsample them for various kinds of analyses. Um, some of them we do in the lab, but things like radiocarbon dating we send uh, to another group to do. And, you know, it's, it's one of those fields where your students will spend a couple of glorious days in the field and then they'll spend two years in the lab working on these sediment cores and coming up with the, the environmental history. The other thing I wanted to, to just touch base on is the difference between weather and climate, right? So we're having weather right now but it's not the long-term climate. 
we're having a, a snowstorm. That's a weather event, something that plays out over uh, hours to days to, I, I suppose you could think of months. Um, but it's not the long-term trend. And what we've seen is a lot of really extreme weather events in the last few years. We've seen really strong hurricanes. We've seen extremely large fires. Um, we've seen floods. We've seen droughts. We've seen huge snowstorms. And those are all weather events. And I think one of the best ways to explain the difference between weather and climate, which I'm sure you guys know, is I found this, um, this video from a, a, a guy in Norway. And if I can get the sound to play, it's really quite a good explanation. Let's see. Battery, 100%. Connected to Let me stop. MacBook. All right, I'm going to stop for a second and see if I can get that to go again. This is going to be a problem. All right, let's start it. Whoop. This can make it make it no. Battery, 100%. Connected to Kathy's MacBook. Hang on, I'm gonna I'm gonna fuss with this because I really want this to work. Um, can somebody help me? That was. You got any ideas? Battery, 100%. Connected to Kathy's MacBook. What do you think? It's connected. Have I turned? It's going through Zoom is what it's doing. Oh, that's such a bummer. Yeah, let's see what it's doing. It's, it's getting some sound. Yeah, it's doing both. Let's see, it's um. I have to have the sound on. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's. It, did the microphone get turned back on? I just turned it on because it needs. Oh, the the um, microphone on the <clears throat> Zoom. Can you turn Zoom off for a minute? Yeah, I can stop the share for a second. Sorry, I want you guys to see this. Bear with me. Oh. Yeah, let's see. So I'm gonna go back to the beginning of that video. Sure, let's see. And you can stop it. There you go. Well, what we could do. Might be able to play it now. We could. Um, can you turn on the microphone? It is on, I think. Short. Oh. Yeah, it's going. It's um. You're looking at the dog. The dog. It's running through your Mac now. No, it's not. Yeah, it's well. running through this. Battery, one hundred percent. I'm gonna try one more time, and then I'm gonna keep going. Let's see, let's see if we can just shut um, oh, Let's see, I'm going to have to... Yeah. Shut down. Uh, oh, so there's some more people watching it too. Well, um, I'll I can do it with, a, I can explain this one, but I do have a... Video. I do have a... Uh, yeah, and then... See, it's, um, let's see, let's try her again. I hope you have some time. Let's try the screen again. Yeah, understand what it is. Yeah, and it's. Is this one? Oh, maybe that's what we can do. Two from the USGS, so they have a lot of time to work on And then you're going to click that guy. <laughs> right. <laughs> I don't know what you've done. Yeah, and then I'll go back to this. Yeah, and then you should. Um, can you turn it on? Battery, 100%. Connected to Kathy's MacBook. All right. Well, that, I'm going to explain it, which is not as cute as hearing this Norwegian guy explain it. Sorry. I've got a video, though, that I won't be able to use either, which is really a bummer. Um, okay, so... A guy is walking a dog. And the dog is 
kind of leading the way. So sometimes the dog goes up and sometimes the dog goes down and you never quite know where the dog is going to go next. Sometimes he's here and sometimes he's there. But you think the dog is going to be there pretty quickly. And why is that? Well, it's because of the man. The man is the one who's really guiding the path of the dog. And we don't know really which way the man's going to go. We don't know the man very well. He could change direction, but, but everything that we know says that the man's going to keep going in this direction. So the point is, is the man is the climate and the dog is the weather. And I think that's a good way to think of the difference between the trend we're on with climate and what we see sort of storm to storm and month to month with weather. Okay, so here's some climate facts that I can share with you. Uh, the last 115 years have been the warmest of the last 1,700 years. We've seen a one and a half degree Fahrenheit increase in temperatures in the U.S. since 1918. And uh, I don't know if you just read in the paper that the last five years are the warmest five years on record. We're the fourth warmest year uh, in 2018. And in 2018, we had 17 sort of weather climate disasters, each of which cost a billion dollars or more. And by that, I mean hurricanes, floods, droughts, tornadoes, fires, severe weather, and so on. So the climate is changing. Here's the path the man is taking. Here's the dog going up and down. Um, but we're definitely on a warmer trajectory by just the observed record. Um, I think it's fair to say, are we seeing something we haven't seen before? Are we really in uncharted territory? And this is where I come in as a paleoclimate person. Um, the first record that people go to is the ice core record from Antarctica. So the ice cores trap CO2, carbon dioxide, so they're our best record of these long-term variations in carbon dioxide. But we can independently in the ice cores look at temperature variation and what you see over the last 800,000 years is that when we have warmer temperatures, the red line goes up, we also have more CO2. And when we have colder temperatures, we have less CO2. And, and that cycle has gone on about eight major times in the last 800,000 years. So up is what we call an interglacial period, and down is a glacial period. Um, so here's the last ice age, and here's the present day. The interesting thing is, that we've had these variations over 800,000 years, but they've been within a band of variability, right? You can see that we don't often exceed levels of CO2 <laughs> or temperature, that glacial, interglacial cycles kind of happen in a range of temperatures. And yet here we are now with CO2. And in fact, that's not even accurate. Here we are now with CO2, or 410 parts per million. And so, you know, by any stretch, I think you have to say we're in new territory for the last 800,000 years. We haven't seen anything with this high a level of CO2. So again, as a paleo person, I say, well, when, when did we last have 410 parts per million, and, and what did it look like? And for that, you have to go to the ocean records. So this is a long record of temperature that was developed um, from isotopic data from the um, equatorial Atlantic. Uh, warm is, is at the top of the graph and cold is at the bottom of the graph. And this goes back five million years. So you can see the temperature's gone up and down, but it was warmer and it's steadily gotten colder. And here's that ice core record. That's the part of the record that reflects that ice core graph I just showed you. <coughs> the last time we had 415 parts per million um, was in the Pliocene. It's like three to five million years ago. And during that time, the world was five and a half to seven and a half degrees Fahrenheit warmer. It was 18 degrees Fahrenheit warmer at the poles. There was no um, ice sheets except in East Antarctica, and sea level was 25 meters higher. And when I look at the pollen records from Pliocene sediments in Montana, they look a lot like what you'd see in South Carolina. It was more humid, there were more deciduous trees, we had some magnolia, oak, and so on. So it's not a bad world, but it's a very different world. You know, it's, the, it's, it's quite a lot different if our climate becomes in equilibrium with even present-day CO2 levels. 
And then this graph came out um, just uh, last year. And this is a compilation of pollen records from North America and Europe. And the pollen records have been converted into temperature data. Um, so there's a lot of variability in those records. But it goes back 11,000 years. So it's the period since the last ice age. The ice age sort of ended around 14,000 years ago. So this is 11,000 years to the present. And what you can see is at the end of the last ice age, it got really radically warmer, um, warming of the magnitude that's, that's projected for the future. But it happened at a much slower rate. Then we sort of crested out about 7,000 to 5,000 years ago. And it's gotten cooler since then. Uh, what you see, here's the mean of these data for the last decade. You can see the last decade is much warmer than the last 11,000 years. Here's the average of the last 11,000 years. And here's 2016 when this study was um, looking at data. 99.4% warmer than anything we've seen in the last 11,000 years. So uh, yeah, I think we are in uncharted territory, at least on these time scales. And um, we should take notice. Okay, so the Montana climate assessment was kind of um, it was kind of a grand experiment on a lot of different levels, and I think because of that, we've gotten a lot of attention uh, both within the state but nationally for the way we did it. Um, it. There is a hard copy, but it's mostly on on the web, and we had four chapters because that's all we had really time to do. Uh, there's a climate chapter, a water chapter, a forestry chapter, and an ag chapter. One of the things that made it a bit great experiment was the partnerships involved, including people here from tech. Uh, it involved the two universities um, through the Institute on Ecosystems. Uh, it involved nonprofits. It involved state agencies, federal agencies. We involved the tribal colleges. So usually these climate assessments are done by a couple of people like you know, scientists will go in their office and kind of write out an assessment and give it to whoever asked for it. But we really spent a lot of time trying to build a broad partnership in Montana in, in the hopes that that would keep the conversation going and, and spark a lot of interest. It was funded not by the state. Uh, it was funded by the last EPSCoR grant. Uh, the purpose of that EPSCoR grant was to look at how ecosystems would respond to climate change. We were able to hire new faculty, including here. Um, and the EPSCoR grant was divided into focus areas. So there was one group, I think Chris working on uh, microbial dynamics and ecosystem processes, and another group looking at landscape patterns, and then a sort of a larger group looking at vulnerability. And we felt that that was just science, you know, science going into scientific papers. And we wanted to really have a, a product that we could give to the state as a result of this EPSCoR grant. So, a very small part of that grant uh, was used to finance the climate assessment. And the other thing uh, that n made us want to do this was that our Constitution guarantees us a right to a, a clean and healthful environment. Um, it was ratified in, I think, 1972. And there hasn't really been much reporting on our state of our environment since then. There was a report in 1975, Montana Environmental Indicators. And then um, there was another report in 96. And then I put the state water plan in that category of a reporting on the status of the state. But not very much, and nothing on climate. So we felt like we had a niche we could fill by doing an assessment. And then the, the final thing that I think has made us kind of unique is this whole project was very stakeholder driven. So before we did any writing, we met up with these stakeholder organizations around the state. And we asked them, we asked them just basic questions. We asked them, how do you use climate information? Uh, what information would you like that you don't have? And how would you like it? And it was their feedback through these listening sessions that we conducted that made us select the forest, water, and ag as the first three topics. And they were the ones that said we should have it as a web-based document, something you could even get on your phone. They didn't want a phone book of a, of a report. Uh, and they've been with us right from the beginning uh, all the way through the project. And also during the release of the project, we had Montana stock growers with us at the release, and the Montana grain growers, and the tribal 
uh, forestry groups. They were all there because we had kept them in the process all along. Uh, and the, we also wanted to be sure that the assessment was not a crazy document. That's always like, as a, as a researcher, that's always my concern. You know, I'll do something and all my colleagues will say, well, I was nuts. You know, why did you do it like that? So we worked really closely with the U.S. national program, the global, U.S. Global Change Research Program, to try to make sure that, that our climate information was aligned and that our, you know, our approach was aligned and that we were sort of feeding into that. And we sent the document out for uh, anonymous peer review at the national level. So we, it was sent out to people in other states to look at, and we got feedback that we had to respond to. Um, so our goal is that we're gonna, we're gonna, uh, that we had the best science, that it was a big partnership, that we focused on sectors that were relevant, and now that it's useful and updatable. Okay, so what's happening with climate in Montana? Well, it's, uh, it's changing. And I've found that one of the best approaches when I'm talking to people around the state is to talk about what we've seen rather than where we're going. People, people that have lived in Montana a long time can see that the climate's changing. Um, and in fact, it's been getting warmer. It's about almost three degrees Fahrenheit warmer than it was in 1950. So this is just a map of temperature across the, across the state. But this is the trend from 1895. Um, we're warming at a faster rate than the US annual average. Uh, I think because we're more of an interior state, we're just more, we just have more temperature extremes. Montana's precipitation, on the other hand, has been highly variable. We've had wet years and dry years. They're often governed by things like um, the ENSO variability, what's going on with that. Uh, but there hasn't been really a strong trend since 1895 in precipitation. Western Montana's gotten a little bit drier in winter, and eastern Montana's gotten a little bit wetter in spring, but nothing really statistically robust. So we start with, I've start, we start with a sort of look at the past and, and share that kind of shared knowledge with everybody. And then we look forward. And the way that we went forward, and this is the work of the Montana Climate Office in Missoula, um, is they looked at the 20 closest uh, global circulation models that did the best job of sort of reproducing Montana's climate now. Um, and they used that ensemble of models and downscaled the results for Montana at a very high resolution. And then they took that high resolution data, which probably isn't realistic, it's too high resolution, and they scaled it back up to the NOAA climate, climate regions. So we have seven climate regions in Montana. And that's the level that we report on in the, in the Montana climate assessment. So we feel like we captured the topographic variability and the east-west gradients and that kind of thing in this approach. But then we put it in fairly general terms. Uh, the other thing is in the assessment, we look at two scenarios. We look at the uh, 4.5 representative concentration pathway, 4.5 and 8.5. And those are um, done internationally. And there are speculations on how, what, the, what kinds of uh, economical, social, environmental changes are going like, to be happening in the decades ahead. How much are we going to reduce our footprint? What's going to be the demand for energy, that kind of thing? 4.5 is what's called the stabilization scenario. And that's the scenario that if we start to curb our outputs of greenhouse gases and meet the um, agreements of the Paris Accord, so we're already on a rise, but we start to flatten out. That's a stabilization scenario. 8.5 is called the business as usual scenario. This is the trajectory we're on of just continually increasing greenhouse gas emissions. And so I'll give you these two panels of maps. This one's more conservative, and that one's sort of the, the trajectory we're on right now. And I'm only going to show you for the mid-century because it's dramatic enough without going to the end of the century. <laughs> and hopefully some of us will be alive to see if the, the climate assessment was right. Um, basically, with temperature, it's going to get warmer. Temperature increases drive almost everything that's going to happen in Montana. We're getting warmer. We've already gotten warmer. We're going to get warmer. Four and a half degrees with one scenario, six degrees with another. The models are in 100% agreement on that. 
We then broke it into regions. So January through December and the, the, the seven climate uh, regions of Montana. So in Butte, we're sort of in that southwest, south central. So you can look at these bars. And the darkness of the color is how much warmer, what time of year you, it's going to get warmer. One thing with temperature, we're getting warmer in the winter and we're getting warmer in the summer. The summers are getting a lot warmer, but every month is getting warmer in these different scenarios. And of course, it's more extreme in the 8.5 uh, business as usual scenario. Again, 100% model agreement. Okay, precipitation is harder to model. Uh, and there's more variability, and that's reflected in the, in the results as well. Um, the signal is spatially variable, um, but every area gets a little bit wetter going into the future. The f and the 4.5 and the 8.5 show that. Um, there's pretty high model agreement. Not all the models show that. About 85% of them do, but a little bit wetter, and especially along the northern tier. And then here it is portrayed by, uh, by month. Uh, and the interesting thing here is the seasonality of precipitation that comes out of these model projections. Um, you can see that winter, springs, and falls get wetter, and summers get drier. And that's another big part of our story, is that we're going to have wetter winters, springs, and falls, drier summers. The models don't have 100% agreement on that. Okay, so how is Montana's climate changing? Well, let's just go through this again. Between 1950 and 2015, there's been already a two to three degree Fahrenheit warming, and winters and springs have warmed the most. Montana's growing season is now 12 days longer, so that's, that's not a bad thing. Um, you know, we grow cantaloupe now, right, in western Montana that are delicious, and that's a new thing. We never could do that. Why are we doing it? It's because it's getting warmer. The growing season's longer. Uh, there's no real changes in annual or seasonal precipitation. There's a little bit of an increase, but when you make it warmer, you also increase evaporation. So that kind of gets offset. Uh, going into the, sorry, uh, that, that was a comment for the future. But going into the future, there's a four to six degree warming. And if, and, I show, and if I showed you the end of the century, it would be about 10 degrees warmer by the end of the century. And precipitation's going to increase in winter, spring, and fall but decrease in summer. OK, so what does it mean for water? So we, this was another chapter of the assessment. And we, again, looked at those uh, seven climate regions, but we then focused on seven watersheds that we thought sort of captured what's going on in Montana. And John helped us with some of the groundwater components of this chapter. Well, the first thing is snowpack. And we have tree ring records of snowpack that go back almost 1,000 years. And so this is the April 1st snow water equivalent based on tree ring reconstructions of snowpack. And you can see that they fluctuate all over the place. There's periods when there's more snowpack and less snowpack. But it's really interesting, I think, to look at what's happening in the last century. Snowpack is just declining. The April 1st snowpack is declining. And you can see that on this long time scale. And then this is shorter data set. This is from University of Washington. Uh, this is um, from Snowtail data, 1955 to 2016. The red dots are showing you where snowpack has declined over that period. Um, and the blue dots are, are where there's been some increase. And you can see that generally, um, there's been a 20 to 80% decline in snow, snowpack in Montana. And that's simply because the winters are getting warmer. Here's a sort of average snowpack west of the divide. And you can, so you can see that looking at individual Montana sites. There's just been you know, a steady decline in um, how much snowpack there is April 1st from 1935 to 2005. But on the other hand, you have crazy years like last year, right, where we had 152% of snowpack in Bozeman and 129% in this area. So there is this weather variability, but the long-term trend is definitely for a declining snowpack. Here's what the, was, is in the climate assessment. Uh, these are 
um, Clark Fork above St. Regis, the Missouri above Tostin, and the Yellowstone above Billings, going into the <coughs> mid-century, um, and it doesn't matter which scenario you use, stabilization or business as usual, there's a significantly less snowpack going into the mid-century. And we're doing some work now in Yellowstone, and I really like this figure, um, which is done by colleagues at the USGS. This is 1950 to the end of the century here. Um, and the green is the elevations where there's rain. The blue is elevations where there's snow. And the, um, the red and golden orange is like that slush that we all hate. <laughs> and what you can see, is, quite simply, is as it gets warmer, the elevation of rain and slush and snow go, go up. And so there's less and less snow cover. And that's why we see that decline in all those stations. And you can see it on the map of Greater Yellowstone here. Blue is where there's snow. This is present day. And that's end of the century. <coughs> OK, and then um, if you have less snowpack, what does that mean for water supply? Again, this is data from University of Washington. Uh, and the top graph there is showing you 1948 to 2002. It's the time of peak runoff in streams. Uh, and what you see is that in this graph, there's this trend over that time period of peak runoff coming about 10 to 15 days earlier. So by the time you get to 2002, the runoff is happening about two weeks before it was in 1948. Uh, and then going into the future, this is the end of the century projection, it's going to be another 15 to 25 days earlier than it is now. So we're really going to see peak runoff happening earlier and earlier in the year. And why is that? <laughs> it's because the snow's melting earlier and it's warmer in the spring. So like I said, everything's being driven by temperature here, one way or the other. Here's streamflow projections for the Clark Fork. Um, so you can see the pattern that's starting to get set up, where we get uh, a lot of runoff earlier in the year, 15 to 25 days earlier. We go into summer with uh, lower projected flows because it's warmer in the summer and there's um, less precipitation. So we're going to get that really strong seasonality where there's the potential of floods in the spring and the, and the definite likelihood of droughts in the end of the summer. So drought, I think drought is one of the things we're going to see. Um, we know about droughts. Droughts is a very hard thing to, there is no like really good definition of drought. There's seasonal drought, and there's long-term droughts. Um, droughts get measured in various ways. Here's the tree ring record of drought for the West. This is uh, 1,200 years of record going from 2000 AD to 800 AD. And drought uh, is up in this graph. And down, and down is wet. And so you can see that we've had these periods of really pronounced drought around 1000 AD. This is the medieval climate anomaly, or the medieval warm period, where it really was pronounced, it was really was very dry in much of the West. And then this is the Little Ice Age, where there was a lot of cooler conditions. And now we're coming out of it. So the good news for Montana, I think, is that these things we call mega droughts, these droughts that last for years to decades. We know we've seen them in the past. We've seen them in Montana, mega droughts, things where it was just drought year after year after year. And I don't think we're seeing that now. We're not seeing mega droughts. We're seeing seasonal droughts. Um, but one thing, we can't really model droughts very well. But one thing we do know is there's going to be more days over 90 degrees Fahrenheit in the future. Uh, maybe as many as 35 in eastern Montana. And when you have those warmer temperatures, you're going to exacerbate drought. So any place that's dry is going to be a lot drier because it's, we're just going to have so many more days over 90. And a good example, I think, of those kinds of conditions are what we saw in 2017 when we had that, you know, that flash drought. They called it, kind of invented that term flash drought, like a flash flood. And the deal was, if you remember, we when we were warm, and we had a very wet uh, kind of end of winter, spring, early summer. It was very warm, but it was wet. And then all of a sudden, the precipitation stopped about um, the end of, when was it? It was about the end of June, early July. And then within a very short period of time with days, we went into an extreme drought. 
So we went from being very warm and wet to being very warm and dry. And that led to these huge fires up in Sealy Lake and a lot of um, you know, damage, large fires in eastern Montana, um, crop failures, and so on. So I think that's going to be in the future. Looking at forests, uh, I'll do this one quickly. Um, one thing that I think it's really important when we talk about our, the health of our forests is that we realize that we have a lot of different kinds of forests in Montana. Um, you know, we have high elevation forests, we have aspen forests, we have low elevation forests. There is not like one forest <coughs> in Montana. <coughs> the average forest, I guess, if you, the most acreage is in Douglas fir, lodgepole pine, ponderosa pine, but we're very diverse. And each of those forests uh, has, has different sensitivity to things like fire, insect outbreaks, and so on. The other thing is that our forests are variously managed and owned. So we have a lot of it owned by the federal government, U.S. Forest Service, and BLM, but a fair amount in state, and a lot of it's in non-industrial private land. And so going into the future, our forests are in different conditions. Some of them have been logged, some of them have burned, burned some of them haven't, some, and so on. The conditions vary, and that makes it kind of complicated. I can't just give you one answer for what's going to happen with our forests. The projections from the MCA are there's going to be direct impacts of climate change on trees, right? Um, where it's wet, warmer climates are going to increase establishment and regeneration. But where it's dry, you're not going to see that. Where it's wet, wet forests are going to have more growth and productivity. That's going to be good. Where it's dry, at the dry end of the forest spectrum, you won't see that. You'll see mortality. Over time, we're going to see shifts in range. The climate where trees are growing now is not going to be suitable for their seedlings. As a result, the seedlings will be established somewhere else. And as a result, we'll see shifts in forest distribution. And then the big thing that we think about now is fire and pathogens and insects. And fire, um, you know, fires have increased. We've had more large stand replacing fires in Montana, you know, than people can remember. They've increased in size and it's, they've increased and occurred in places where it doesn't really matter what the management practices were. Um, just warm weather is associated with fire. Uh, there's a new study that just came out that says Montana's forests are losing carbon. They're no longer carbon sinks, but because of all the fires and the insect outbreaks, they're actually becoming, we're losing carbon. They're coming carbon sources. Our fire season in the West is now over seven months. In California, it's over 300 days. The fire season is over 300 days in California. Um, where it used to be a very discreet fire season just lasting a few months. I go back to my paleo perspective here. So here's 600 years of fire history from tree rings and charcoal data. The red line is showing you when fire activity. So when it's up, it's lots of fires. And when it's down, there's fewer fires. And the gray line and the dashed line is temperature reconstructions from tree rings. And one of the things you can see is fire and temperature track really closely. So here's the medieval climate period. We had a lot of fires, and it was warmer. Here's a little ice age. We had fewer fires, and it was cooler. But then you come into the 20th century and into the 21st century, and what you see is the number of fires has gone way down, but the temperatures have gone up. And so a lot of my colleagues call this the fire deficit. And what the fire deficit is is that even though we've had a lot of fires, we probably would be having even more fires if our forests weren't so fragmented, um, if there hadn't been such a strong fire suppression effect in many forests and so on. So the news is more fires. <laughs> and this paper came out that um, looked at all of the fires in the western U.S. going back to 1985. And so this is the area burned going up there. And these guys um, did what's called attribution science, where they said, how much of that increase in area burned can we attribute to anthropogenic climate change or to human-caused human -caused climate change? And that's the orange part of the graph. And they say that they statistically think that 55% of the area burned in the West could be directly attributed to climate change. 
That is, without anthropogenic climate change, we would have had much less fires. And these fires aren't just a Montana story, and it's not just a California story. We are seeing large fires around the world, right? We've seen large fires in Scandinavia, in Siberia, Cape Town, South Africa's burning now, Greece has had big fires, Mediterranean, Tasmania's been burning, Australia. Fires are happening everywhere. Um, and we've had insect outbreaks, you know, I can't help but be impressed whenever I drive here from Bozeman about just the extent of the mountain pine beetle impact, which is shown here in the blue and the purple. And those two are related to climate. We, they, those outbreaks have happened in the past, but they tend to be more severe in a warmer climate. Okay, so let me just kind of wrap this up a little bit. Um, I think we all have to get ready in Montana for ecological change. We're going to see it. It's coming. It's going to be triggered by things like fire and outbreaks, um, things drying out. Animals are going to be moving around. And things like white bark pine are probably one of the most vulnerable because white bark pine forests grow at the tops of mountains. And as you make it warmer, you're just going to keep pushing those white bark pines off the tops of the mountains, and they'll grow somewhere else. They probably won't go extinct. They'll probably be in Canada, but they won't be growing here. And what does it mean for us? Well, we see, like, you know, there's sort of three vulnerable economies in Montana. Um, first are all these people that are moving to Montana because of the amenities, uh, because of the recreation opportunities. Um, that's why they're coming to Montana. They're going to be very vulnerable to climate change, right? Because a lot of the reasons why they move here are going to be changing. Um, snowpack, fishing, the fisheries, and so on. Then we have these sort of long traditions of resource dependent sectors, things like agriculture, timber, mining. And they're going to be vulnerable to climate change in part because they're going to be vulnerable to things like the commodity price trends or regulatory and management decisions that are going to affect the way they do business. And then we have these persistently poor rural communities that are very isolated, especially in eastern Montana. They're a long ways from services and um, they face sort of continual poverty. And of course, they're going to be vulnerable to climate change. So in the last year, we've gone around and talked to different communities uh, about the Montana climate assessment and what we think, what we see from that document. We've, um, you know, I've talked to communities, I've talked to schools, I've talked to town halls, I've talked to the legislature and the governor. Um, We've been in roundtable discussions. I've been to rallies. I've been out in the field with Native Americans looking at plants that are really concerned to them. And we've sort of been having a, a discussion. I hope we can have one here. The things that come up over and over in these ro roadshow events is what are we going to do about water and what should we be thinking about with water storage? Um, floods and droughts, these kinds of extreme hydrologic events are. We've seen them recently, and, and we're likely to see them again. Uh, a lot of communities want to know what to do about wildfire, both not only after the wildfire, but how can they be better prepared before. Um, there's a lot of questions from the ag community about what they should do with livestock and various crop decisions. And then people are worried about their livelihoods and also about their health. So I think there's challenges and opportunities ahead. <laughs> uh, I think, for one thing, we have to learn to live with wildlife, because we're going to probably see more wildlife at the, you know, where we're living. Um, animals are on the move. Um, they're trying to find resources um, that are no longer available. And we're going to have to think about connectivity for wildlife, given, given that things are changing. We are going to see more wildfires. I, there's no doubt about that. Um, there's been this increase in wildfires. Some of our forests are impacted by fire suppression policies. Not all, but some have very high fuel loads. And the main thing is that we're seeing this huge increase in growth at the interface between wildlands and cities. You know, that zone, that wildland-urban interface is the fastest growing um, land use in the country. And it's... Um, we think that f 
we think that those are going to be the most vulnerable places to uh, burn, and it's true no matter where we look in the West. And I won't show that because I don't think I have sound, which is too bad. Um, agriculture is interesting because um, I hadn't really, I'm, I'm not a farmer, and I, I really learned a lot about agriculture just being involved in the climate assessment. And one thing that I really appreciated was the decision space for farmers and ranchers is so complicated, you know, that they're making decisions on the moment, but they're based on a whole bunch of factors. They're based on global prices. The price of lentils in India has as much impact on a farmer as what's happening in Montana. And they're, they're looking at local prices and they're, the expected price that they're going to receive and what kinds of production inputs they should add in terms of fertilizers or herbicides to deal with pests. And climate's going to impact all of that, but not immediately and not directly. And it's just one part of the decision space that people operate in. So for example, in Montana, we're really well known for our spring wheat. Um, spring wheat has a, has a high gluten content, so people that make bread around the world flour really value spring wheat. Um, and we, that may be highly vulnerable because it may be that the winters are too that are the winters are too warm or the summers dry out too soon for spring wheat to mature, and it's not clear that we're going to really do much better with winter wheat. Um, so I know in my university anyway, there's a whole lot of effort in trying to develop new varieties of spring wheat that are going to be more tolerant to these kinds of flash drought situations that we see, and uh, new treatments, more emphasis on things like precision agriculture, um, and then looking at other crops completely. So I think there's opportunities in agriculture, and uh, that's, that's the vibe I get talking to farmers and ranchers. There's opportunities for greater crop diversity. Like I said, we're growing cantaloupes now. Um, there is, we have to think about late season irrigation. That's going to be a stress point. And we have to think about ways to conserve water, especially for a lot of these crops that really depend on agriculture at the end of the summer, things like hay, sugar beets, malt barley, potatoes, that kind of thing. Um, we need new practices and closer monitoring and, and new varieties that can withstand heat stress. So livestock, as I understand it, um, can, wi can withstand really hot days, but they need to cool off at night to kind of regroup. And if we have warmer and warmer nights, that's a real problem. And I've had people in the agriculture at, you know, talk about whether they should calve a week earlier because it's warming up so fast, or calve a week later. Um, those are the kinds of things we need to talk about. Um, we also need to realize that the climate is going to be well suited for a lot of these winter annual weeds. Things like cheatgrass is really on the spread, and even crabgrass in eastern Montana is spreading from, I think of crabgrass as a lawn problem, but it's spreading in agricultural fields as well, simply because it's warmer. Um, living with uncertainties in our future, I'd say. We're going to have a shortened winter season. I mean, we're getting snow now, but I'm really curious what it's going to be like in a month, right? You guys might, might be thinking that too. We have less stable snow conditions and these kind of more rain on snow conditions or snow turning to rain. All of that's leading to a greater chance of flooding because of this earlier concentrated peak runoff season. And so for people that depend on winter, conditions, the shoulder seasons especially are going to be uncertain. So that's going to affect things like the ski industry in Montana. In summer, on the other hand, <clears throat> I think we're going to be the go-to place for a lot of parts of the country. Uh, we're going to see more visitors. We're already seeing more visitors in places like the national parks here in Montana. Um, and as a result of more people coming here to get away from heat, we're going to have more animal interactions. It's going to put more um, stress on our infrastructure. And I always think when it's hot in the summer, where do you go? You go to the lake. You go to the river. So our aquatic resources are going to be really impacted. We're seeing already high temperatures and low flows and how that's affecting our fish, uh, fish diseases, and, and, and as a result, putting on angling and boating regulations. And then the other one is living with health risks. 
So the next task for us is we're writing another, we're writing a special report on climate change and human health in Montana because we have these heat and smoke related illnesses showing up. Um, elsewhere in the country there's cardiopulmonary illness, there's these, this possibility of insect vector diseases, vector borne diseases and water borne diseases. You know we already have the highest suicide rate per capita in Montana but I think heat and extreme events is likely to make that worse. And then in some places they're seeing even um, impacts to, to um, pregnancies. So anywhere we are, climate change means two things. It means we either have to think about how to ad adapt to it, and I think Montanans are really good at that. We also have to think about how we're going to reduce our greenhouse gas footprint. So you've got like adaptation, mitigation, or suffering <laughs> of doing nothing. We have to think about all those. And there's a couple of things going on. One is that there's now a lot of NGOs are taking on this sort of adaptation space. It's really nice to see in our, our extension services. We're forming a, a new um, kind of a partnership with a lot of the people that were involved in the climate assessment. We're calling it MAKE, um, Montana Adaptation Knowledge Exchange, where we're listening to the needs that are posed by the assessment and trying to develop research and projects around it. Um, this is leading to a big effort in Precision Ag, um, this health report, um, some fire, fire adaptation strategies. So we're, we're busy thinking about that. And then this thing just came, was just introduced in Congress. Um, you might check it out. It's called the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act. Uh, and it's a kind of a serious effort at, at mitigation um, by imposing a carbon fee and then giving the, the fee back to the people so everyone would, get, would benefit from that fee being collected on CO2. Um, and there's the link to it. You can get it from Citizens Climate Lobby. So that's where I'll stop. And I'll thank you very much. I'm happy to take questions. Yeah. On those large climate models, what's the resolution? Is it the size of Montana? Is it much smaller? The size of Montana counties? What? The climate, the, those general climate models are used for weather forecasting. So your 10-day forecasts are being done by the same set of models. And they have the capacity to go to a very fine resolution. You know, they can just statistically downscale it. But the most accurate ones are about 25 kilometers squared to slightly bigger. Yeah. In the case of, of, of the climate office here, they took those fairly, that fairly coarse resolution and then they super statistically put it onto a topographic landscape so that they could you know, see the, see the climate differences as you go up a mountain or in a valley kind of thing. Yeah, Chris. I have a question. Is, uh, when you're, you have bad fires in the Big Hole River, you go up there in August and the temperature from the view to the wisdom will drop down to 30 degrees sea Then you get cold, cold. You couldn't see the sun. Oh, yeah. And it just got cool. <clears throat> And I'm just wondering if, if there's a part of the model where uh, the smoke would, you know, but really be local, I guess, would, would cause cooling. And maybe yeah, I'm curious about that because this, this health report we're doing, one of the big things is smoke. And so the question that we're, asked, we're working with the climate office is, can you, could you give us a smoke forecast? And so that's exactly what you're talking about, you know, how, how much smoke and how far does it travel and that kind of thing. And I mean, I know models do terribly with clouds. They do, they have a hard time with convection, so they don't do well with lightning. Um, but that's always improving and, is, and, and there's also this sort of development of regional climate models that are a little more dynamic. Um, but I don't think, they, they, there's no way they would have kept, they would capture a smoke plume from a fire. Um, maybe, you know, maybe doing a 10-day weather forecast, they would, but I don't know. It's a good question, though. Yeah. 
But hopefully, I'll be, you know, stay tuned. But when it's that bad, it's not, I'm sorry to interrupt. But no. When, it, when it's that much smoke, you want to get out of there. Yeah. It's not like going, oh, it's nice. It's, it's cool. cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes? I have a question about water wars uh, coming up. When, when is the uh, adjudication going to be done for the state? Because we've got surface water adjudication that's, I don't even know how far along it is. June mm -hmm. this year. For what region? June this year. It's, well, it's supposed to be statewide. Statewide. For the whole state? June this year. All the, all the grand questions. <coughs> I'm sure well, somebody see, knows that more I than I still think that's. Know. Like in the Bitterroot, they're still working through that down in like the Hamilton area. So I don't know if June is that. I can imagine without adjudication being finalized in the next decades, it's going to complicate water wars and who owns what water at what time of the year and the stack of paperwork for them to go through. Is so I, don't, I do not know how they can do that. It's, it's enormous. Well, and people say they, you know, there's almost like a motivation to use water rather than conserve it, right? So you don't lose the right to um, yeah. your water rights. Yeah, play out with some I, I think the word is everybody wants more. <laughs> <laughs> well, and also with like the DNRC, there, I mean, there's been talk about trying to make the access to water earlier because of the quicker releases and the greater releases to give the people with the water rights, I mean, it's going to have to go, I mean, it's going to be a nightmare, but to have the ranchers be able to use the water earlier to either like store some of it for later return flows or just so start the, because the, you know, the growing season's getting longer and starting earlier so that they can release the, I mean, it's, it, you're right, it's going to be a mess and I don't know what's going to happen in decades down the road, but that's some of the things that they're talking about. I thought there was, isn't there some legislation that's getting looked at to not penalize somebody for not using, be, for conserving water rather than using it or something? Yeah, maybe. I, uh, yeah. Would make sense to me mm -hmm. to not, to incentivize. Yeah. What? There are people in the Bureau who would know that. Do you know that, John? It's, I, I, my understanding, I think, is that to put it in these, these water reserves so they can, they can, they can like, for a period of time, uh, not use their water, not be penalized. Because, uh, you know, the prior appropriation doctrine is all about use it or lose it, first in time, first in right. So those who have those senior water rights are really kind of privileged, and there is no incentive for them to, you know, kind of conserve. The, the, the incentive is all there for to, to use every drop they're entitled to. And so um, they're very hesitant about trying to work with schemes to maybe, you know, promote in stream flows for fear that they would lose the right. So I think there was some legislation to try to relax that for a certain period of time where they could put it into these some sort of conservation right. kind of easements and not lose their right. Right. To do it. Thanks. Do you have um, BP or DAPL transferation in the model? No, this assessment is is just like ridiculously simple. We just looked at temperature and precip. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Which would be obviously, yeah, we should look at ET. Yeah. Uh huh. It gets warmer. Yeah, and there's no feedback. There's no real, you know, feedbacks in the system, like change, you know, changing vegetation or disturbance and things like that. Oh. Yeah. We're hoping, we're hoping there'll be another assessment. Um, in some ways, it was great that we had this EPSCOR grant because we could fund it. And, but you know, now it's like, well, what do we do next? Um. I, think, I think you probably told us that uh, the risk of flooding in the spring, and that's occurring earlier by how much? I don't think you might have told us. About two weeks earlier than like the 19, 1950, yeah, so in, on average, for the West. For the West, about mm -hmm. two weeks. Mm -hmm. and, and it's, it's supposed to be even to two to three, yeah, three weeks, something like that, going into the future. And, you know, as I said again, it, it, it's all related to temperature, I think. You know, it's not, we're not that complicated in terms of what's going to happen. We're getting warmer, and that affects how much snow we have and how long it lasts and how fast it melts and how dry it is in the summer. <laughs> so with that being said, then the flooding risk <coughs> is going to occur earlier 
probably larger, yeah. larger floods. Yeah, yeah. The film I would have showed you is from the Muscle Shell Watershed Group. They've really done a lot to try to manage. They've been you know, flooded for a few years now. And they've really gotten together to really talk about how they can manage their water as a group and um, really you know, try to be a little more prepared. I'm sorry if I've missed this coming in late, but um, does your organization uh, support, advocate with regard to making change within the 12 year time frame that's been recommended? Are you involved with any lobbying efforts right now with yeah. legislation? Or? Well, I'm at the university, so I'm in the same playing field as a lot of people here. I'm at Montana State University. And I would say our universities are pretty conservative about climate change just because of the kind of composition of our state leaders, or state legislature maybe. So they don't, you know. But individually, I think people are being very active. And so there's two documents that came out in the last year. Um, one is this updated IPCC report. And what it says is that the Paris Agreement of capping it at 2 degrees centigrade really is, is not fast enough, and, and, and it's, it's not enough. We need to cap it at, we need to cap greenhouse gases so that we don't get warmer than 1.5 degrees centigrade by mid-century, which is 12 years from now. And the things that they see happening that are most notable um, are, is the loss of corals. If we, if we cap, if we can cap warming at 1.5 degrees by mid-century, uh, then we'll only lose like, I think it's 85% of the corals, but if we go to all the way to two, we're, we won't have corals in the ocean. It's too warm and the oceans are becoming too acidic. Um, so there was that, re that report, and um, yeah, that's kind of a, that's a real wake-up call. And then the other thing that came out is the um, National Climate Assessment came out with their fourth assessment, and they, uh, so here's the, here's the IPCC report where they, they show like different degrees of warming. Um, so two degrees warming puts us here and the darker the purple is like the more serious the impact. And here's 1.5. And so the thing that gets lost are these corals and sea ice in the Arctic and then coastal flooding is really a strong signal. The National Climate Report is kind of interesting. They show all these different things that have changed in climate. So they have this one figure that's got all these graphs of Arctic sea ice and trends in U.S. drought and pre heavy precipitation and fires and snowpack and sort of show which things have, have increased or amplified and which things have decreased. But what I liked about it is they really make the point that climate-related disasters are costing us. They're costing us money. Um, billions of dollars annually, and they say by the end of 2100, it'll be 10% of our gross national product. We'll just be dealing with these disasters. Um, and the other thing the National Climate Assessment does that's nice is they start to make linkages in a nice way. The droughts and population changes lead to shortages in water and pressure on energy. And this was really interesting in the report, destruction of infrastructure, like in Houston, they had such big flooding, such big floods, that the tunnels flooded, so they couldn't provide emergency services to different parts of the city because the city was underwater. There's like a lot of infrastructure planning that we need to be thinking about going into the future. The National Climate Assessment, I should also say, looks at Montana's in the north, central, northern Great Plains region. So Everything about Montana is sort of averaged out with the Dakotas and Nebraska and Wyoming. So it's not a very, you know, Montana specific look, and it certainly doesn't think about mountains in that chapter. Yes? Oh, yeah. they, these changes go so far in that I've heard the theories is that if they get uh, past the point of no return, it wouldn't matter if you made any of these changes, they're permanent now. Is that a, a real worry or? Well, there's, I mean, we're on a warming trend for the next few decades, but we still can, I think, by reducing emissions, we can still flatten that out by mid-century. Um, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm an optimist. 
um, although I'm, it's really getting kind of pushed. <laughs> but I think we have the capacity, you know, we have the capacity to fix this problem. Um, and it's nice to see these pieces of legislation get introduced. You know, I, I think the chances of them getting passed are probably really slim, but, but it's, you know, the conversation's moving forward. Um, right to your congressman. Check out the Citizens Climate Lobby page if you uh, if you're at all think about this stuff. Um, they really have a lot of good information, and they're a very active group. Mm -hmm, CCL. It's, it's sorry. So I'm just curious about the possibility of like how nitrous oxide contributes to global warming, and if it is um, has a higher capacity for um, increasing our atmospheric temperature, and so is it being uh, is are these models based solely on CO two concentrations, um, and are the active uh, reactive nitrogen Considered in these is this something that you study? No, but okay. I, I heard some people talking about this years and years ago, and I yeah. never had an answer to this question. I'm not a biogeochemist. Maybe, I don't know, Bev, are you, the, are you a biogeochemist? No. Is any biogeochemist here? Nitro, nit, nitrogen, nitrous oxide, N2O and NO2 are greenhouse gases for sure. Um, the focus is on CO2 because it's, it's bigger and it's more stable in the atmosphere, right? It's, it hangs out in the atmosphere longer. Methane is a more powerful greenhouse gas than, say, carbon dioxide, but it has a shorter kind of time in the atmosphere. So yes to, to nitrogen, and it's the big inputs there are fertilizers. Um, and that's, that's as far as I can answer. But somebody, I'm sure somebody else knows more. We should give her a break. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.